Did you ever realize that the avatars of Vishnu closely track the theory of evolution? Really? Yes. My grandfather pointed this out to me more than 40 years ago and it still blows my mind. Okay. okay. Let's just go through the 10 avatars one after the other. Okay. The first avatar, Matsya avatar, is a huge fish that lives in an ocean. Correct. Okay. We now know that life originated in the ocean and fish came before any land-based animals. True. Okay. The second avatar, hmm. Kurma, is a turtle, hmm. an amphibian which is making its first tentative attempts at living on land, right? Yeah. Without giving up the comfort zone of water, right? So again, this is something that happened in evolution. Correct. Slowly, the water-based animals started coming out on land. True. Okay. The third avatar, Varaha, the boar, lives in the mud near the water, right? Hasn't yet... Completely let go of the water. Exactly, yeah. The fourth avatar, Narasimha, is half beast, half man, indicating that first came animals and then slowly animals evolved into man. So that's why there is this half man, half beast thing. Right? The missing link? The missing link, exactly. <laughs> okay. The fifth avatar, huh. Vaman, the dwarf, is short and stunted, right? It's just like Australopithecus and all the early uh, forms of uh, humanoids. Correct, exactly, right? Sixth avatar, Parshuram, is a fully built strong warrior who fights alone and is driven by base emotions, mostly anger and revenge, not a sophisticated person. So up till now, hmm. we saw the evolution from fish to amphibians to animals to humanoids. Right? Correct. Now we are going to see the evolution from of social behaviors. Among right? humans. Among humans. From an individualistic base emotions parshuram hmm. to sophisticated humans living in society. Right? right. So the seventh avatar, hmm. Rama, is the guy who follows the rules of society. Right? In letter and its spirit. Right? Mostly, there was one moment of weakness during the Wali episode, but we can ignore that. We'll do another episode on the Wali episode, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, so this is, you know, there is society, there are rules of society which need to be followed. Yeah. And we have reached there. And plus we think of a whole bunch of things like duty and respect to parents yeah. and promises to be kept and so on. Yeah, from right. from complete anger and uh, uh, base emotion reactions, we have mm -hmm. gone to thoughtfulness and uh, living in a society with rules and whatnot. Okay. Right. So, before we continue, let me ask this, ha. right? Doesn't this seem like the pinnacle of evolution? What else is there? How can you get better than this? That's a trick question. That's bait. I am not going to answer yes. it. How can you get better? The next avatar, ha. Krishna, ha. is the guy who realizes that if you follow rules, right, people are going to take advantage of you. That's not getting better. It is getting better. Krishna is the guy who does whatever is necessary to get the right things done, right? He is the <laughs> practical guy who knows all the rules and he knows when the rules are to be broken, right, to get the right result. So, Krishna. Okay, fine. That's the eighth avatar. Correct. Ram is called Maryada Purushottam, right? The mm. one who follows the rules. But Krishna ha. is called the Purna Purushottam, right? Oh. Ram is incomplete. Krishna is complete. You're going to start a war out there. Not but, just in the comments. Well, everywhere. Well, it's written in the Vedas. Okay. Sure. Clearly, Krishna comes after Ram. All right. Like the next avatar. Fine. Right, we yeah. get it. The 10th avatar, mm -hmm. Kalki, is clearly climate change avatar. Come to destroy humanity for our sins, for the way we are misusing the world. Right? One second. You skipped avatar number 9. That's a bit of a mess. Okay. okay. People can't agree on what the ninth avatar is. Okay. Depending on which region and which tradition you follow. Huh. Okay. First 8 avatar everybody is agreed on. Yes. Right? Ninth avatar, some people say it is Balram, some people say it is Buddha, some people say it is Vithoba, right? So I think it's just 
you know let's just forget about the ninth avatar ninth right? avatar is us it's yeah. all of us well Sub- we can we can say ninth avatar is coalition politics so <laughs> we can just move on from there but uh, does this mean that ancient indians knew about the theory of evolution absolutely not okay i'm just pointing out that the parallels are amazing i don't know how that happened it is a coincidence of some sort Okay. okay but it is important to realize yeah. that just because somebody imagined something yeah. doesn't make it science doesn't make it true okay okay my mom loves talking about the pushpak viman <laughs> and that oh just because they described the pushpak viman flying in the air means that they knew how to make things fly in the air no anybody can dream up any amazing thing right yeah. unless you figure out how to build it and there is evidence of it being built yeah. it doesn't really exist right just because the brahmastra was described in our ancient wars hmm. doesn't mean we knew how to make nuclear weapons right we need to be able to distinguish between science fiction and science okay yeah. the things mentioned in the vedas are science fiction okay now don't get me wrong there is a lot of brilliant stuff in the vedas exactly. including brilliant science okay? okay so for example uh, i mean our mathematicians and astronomers were the best in the world right uh, like aryabhat hmm. who calculated the di- diameter of the earth 1000 years before columbus screwed it up right okay. brahmagupta who first pointed out that things are attracted towards earth no matter which side on earth you are on oh. so he was talking about the force of gravity the word gurutvakarshan mm. which is gravity in indian languages came from him 1000 years before newton right okay. madhav mm. who discovered infinite series for sin cos and arctan and knew about convergence of infinite series this is a precursor the key idea behind calculus right huh. so there was a lot of good stuff right but one problem mm. with the old indian traditions mm. was very nicely articulated by al biruni okay, okay. al biruni is the persian scholar mm. who visited india mm. and in the year 1030 mm. right he said the following he said i can only compare their mathematical and astronomical literature as far as i know it to a mixture of pearl shells and sour dates okay. or of pearls and dung <laughs> or of costly crystals and common pebbles okay both kinds of things are equal in their eyes since they cannot raise themselves to the methods of a strictly scientific deduction okay i want you to think carefully about this critique and you will realize this is right yeah okay yeah we have brilliant people with brilliant achievements hmm. and then we have charlatans and fakes right and we put both sets of people on the same pedestal and we do not have a system to distinguish between the two that is where the scientific method differs yeah. from this what is we basically used to do. this is basically making me question the validity of something i learned as a child vedic maths well I mean this is the problem with India right because we don't have systems to distinguish like solid stuff from bogus stuff huh. right we end up with vedic maths which is neither vedic nor maths what do you mean okay. neither vedic nor maths it is so, maths vedic maths was created by shankaracharya bharati krishna tirtha okay in 1965 1965 yes huh. this guy published a book with sutras huh. which have these mathematical techniques yeah. and claimed that these are from the vedas right okay vedic scholars were not able to find this in anything right and when they asked him to point out where exactly which ved huh. he said oh this is a parishishta a supplementary in an undiscovered version of atharva veda which he had managed to find and of which there is no other copy in existence only he knows about it right okay not just that scholars have searched throughout all the stuff we know about huh. and they have not found anything remotely similar oh. not forget the vedas right not even in the post vedic period we had some great mathematicians later on yeah. right they did great things but not this for example huh. this thing uses decimals huh. our maths was all based on fractions right this thing mentions things to do with calculus which didn't exist, exist back right? then okay so this guy just made this up 
and called it Vedic Maths. Now the other problem huh? is that it's not even maths because this is calculation. Just doing mental calculations fast. Okay? It's arithmetic. It is arithmetic. Maths is not about calculations. Maths is about proofs. Maths is about deduction. Maths is about logic, right? Fast calculations is such a small part of maths. And in fact, hmm. some of these techniques hmm. are decent techniques. Okay. Right? Most of them are not even very good. They're actually slower than just doing the normal method. Okay. The argument I've heard is if you practice them frequently enough, you'll get faster at them and it will make your life easy and whatnot. No, it will not make your life easier because you practice regular maths enough, you will get faster at that. It will be faster than this stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so are you saying we should discard all of the knowledge of the Vedas? And no, 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 no. Right. Let's be very clear okay. about... The fact that the Vedas have pearls and dung. Okay. okay. What we need to do yeah. is we need to figure out ways yeah. of being able to pick out the pearls from the dung. Right. We have a tendency to say that if it was in the Veda, it must be something amazing. Right. Ah. No, it contains all kinds of crap. Okay. Things to note. Hmm. Much of the stuff about philosophy, spirituality, right? All of that is really good stuff. Okay. Okay. We had lots of philosophers, lots of them arguing with each other mm. and their arguments getting strengthened and so on. So lovely place to look for spirituality mm. uh, and things related to religion, including atheism. We have a very strong tradition of atheism in Hinduism, right? Yes. Problem is with the more scientific things, right? There we need to understand what is the way to separate the pearls from the dung, right? Okay. If something has been mentioned in the Veda, mm. right? Is it true or not? Mm. Is it still applicable or not? Mm. Right? So I want to take two examples. Okay. One is Ayurveda. Mm. Okay. I mean, homeopathy is complete bullshit, but Ayurveda is not, right? Yeah, there is okay. actually a lot of useful stuff there. Mm. The problem with modern Ayurveda is that it's really difficult to know which part is really good and which part is bogus, right? That is one, hmm. because there aren't enough studies. It is just a whole bunch of claims in a 2000 year old book, which yeah. might or might not be applicable. Hmm. Second problem is that there are no standardized processes, no quality control, right? You go to a Vaid, hmm. an Ayurvedic Vaid, you have no idea whether that person is any good or a quack, right? Because where are the bodies? Accreditation, right? Yeah, the accreditation so, bodies. Sorry. Yeah. Similarly, hmm. with Vastu. Okay. Vastu is this whole thing about these rules to follow for your house to be a really good house. East to west facing. I can completely imagine these being really useful rules when we all lived on the Gangetic Plains where water all came from this direction and went in that direction. It was all on the plains, right? The plumbing was not indoor plumbing, yeah. right? And the sun rose in the east, set in the west, and there was no uh, artificial lighting other yeah. than like, you know, candles. And the so, eyes and earth and whatnots. Correct. Now, how much of that is applicable today? A few things might be, the sun still rises in the east, right? Yeah. But indoor plumbing means that most of the stuff about water is no longer useful, right? Makes sense. Uh, similarly, things about the construction methods are different. And what Vastu has done is that instead of modernizing, instead of figuring out which ones are applicable and which are not, they're just importing everything wholesale <laughs> and saying, yes, just you have to follow all of this because... 2000 years ago, this guy said it, right? It, so, it basically comes out to blind adherence to something that has been handed down to you via tradition. Exactly. And right. that is not always good. Correct. There Correct. are some cases which we have discussed previously where it does hold good in very specific situations. For example, we did an episode yeah. on uh, old justice system versus new justice system and we did a short, small comparison yeah, of yeah. In sorts. general, see, traditional things have a lot of value. Hmm. Okay. But you have to realize that the world is not the same. The world is different, right? So you have to know which things to keep and which things to throw, throw out, away. discard. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so do check out that episode uh, on uh, traditional justice systems versus the modern justice system. It has an interesting story at the beginning, which I'm sure uh, you'll appreciate and enjoy. 
uh, we'll line that episode up next for you. But uh, he's right. We need to be absolutely aware of which parts of tradition we are following blindly and which parts of tradition need to be updated, keeping in mind the current situation of the world, the current uh, changes that have happened since that tradition was put into practice. Lots to think about there. Anything to add? Mm. Shrikant, Naveen, Future IQ. <laughs>